Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Wednesday, May 3rd. Thanks for joining us. We had a busy morning on the roadways. Let's go ahead and start off with Stephen Cavazos. It still seems to be the case, unfortunately, guys, as we get a look here at 35 at Topper Wine. Now, this has really been a crash that I've been talking about for now almost two hours. You can see no cars out there on 35 northbound. Normally, that would be great news, but unfortunately, a very serious crash has been reported there in the northbound lanes, which has completely shut the area down. You may have received a push alert on your phone earlier. We at least saw one uh, lane that was still open there as folks were exiting Loop 1604 at 35 northbound, but now first responders have completely shut that area down due to this serious crash. I have reached out to the Live Oak Police Department uh, working to get some information to see exactly uh, the severity of this crash. What actually happened? How many injuries? Do we know of any injuries right now? We're working to get that information confirmed for you, but it does look like we may be seeing just the tail end of this. But nonetheless, we're going to work to find out exactly what caused this incident. And you see a portion of the map there that has completely just disappeared, and that is because things have been closed off there between Topper Wine and Loop 1604. This is in the northbound lanes of 35. So I would still say it's best to avoid the area, but again, we may be seeing the tail end of this. We'll work to get some information on that particular incident a little bit later this morning, but as you get a wide look at the metropolitan area here in San Antonio, Things are a little better. Uh, still some of that active construction that you can see in and around the area, as well as some slow uh, slowdowns that have been lingering for a little while. But the big issue has really been back over here at 35. I'll get on the phone with our friends at Transguide. have been providing updates on air, online. Scan this QR code. It takes you directly to our case at traffic page. We have a list of all the current incidents uh, that are happening. And of course, any of the closures that could impact your commute. So know before you go, let's head over to Justin Horn with a look at our forecast. Stephen, thank you, and uh, we'll start with a look outside. We've got mostly clear skies at this point, so uh, clouds have already cleared out. We know it's going to be a warm day. And speaking of heat, remember the heat index? It's back. We've got humidity, heat, and that means it's going to feel warmer than that actual air temperature, especially as we get into the weekend. Uh, what about some storms tomorrow? We're still watching the timing and location, but the computer models are starting to become uh, in agreement, get better agreement here as far as what's going to unfold tomorrow. We're going to pass that along to you. Also, uh, severe storms possibility not only tomorrow, but all the way through Monday. So there's some opportunities there. It's going to be isolated stuff, not widespread, but we do need to keep an eye on it. 71 right now with a bit of morning cloudiness, but that's quickly going away. Dew point is at 65. We've got an easterly wind at about five miles per hour. Uh, the radar is showing a few showers down uh, south of Catula between Catula and Laredo, but these are dying down and we'll stay well south of San Antonio. So our case had 12 hour forecast 79 noontime. We'll call it partly cloudy today. Temperatures up around 84. Again, it may feel just a little bit warmer than that today and temperatures fall into the 70s tonight. Those better chances of rain arrive tomorrow. We'll time that out for you coming up in just a couple minutes, guys. Bear County Sheriff's deputies respond to a disturbance call that ends in a deadly shooting. It happened last night just before 1030 at home on Forsythia, not far from Smithson Valley Road and Bulverde Road in far north Bear County. According to Sheriff Javier Salazar, deputies were talking to a woman at that home when shots were heard. We were told the woman and the deputy got out. Then the suspect walked out of that house and started shooting more. Deputies fired back, killing the suspect. Authorities are continuing their investigation. San Antonio firefighters had a tough time fighting this fire at a home on the south side of town. This was the scene just after 1.30 this morning on McKinley Avenue, not far from South Presa and I-10. We are told that fire crews did not have access to the attic, so they had to cut through the roof to get to the flames. The five people inside were able to get out safely, and the Red Cross is helping them find a place to stay in the meantime. Right now, it's not clear how much damage there was. Any morning headlines, more arrests made after the capture of the alleged shooter who killed five in Cleveland, Texas, and the Border Patrol getting some support. Plus, another northern city mayor complaining about receiving asylum seekers from Texas and throwing out accusations, and a teenage driver crashes doing 70 miles over the speed limit and takes out a police officer. David Sears is here with your morning headlines. Morning, Dave. 
Right. Great lesson for parents of teenagers just learning to drive or still young in the driving chair. So we'll have that for you in just a second. Well, let's start with this. More arrests have been made after the capture of a man who's accused of allegedly shooting and killing five people, including nine-year-old boy in Cleveland, Texas, on Friday. We just learned from the sheriff of Montgomery County that the wife of the suspected shooter has been taken into custody. She was arrested this morning and is in the Montgomery County Jail. She's charged with hindering the apprehension or prosecution of a known felon. Still waiting to find out how many more have been or will be arrested and who they are and how they are related to the alleged shooter. Those arrests come after the capture of 38 year old Francisco Oropesa. He was hiding out for four days, but now he is in the San Jacinto jail. His bond has been set at $5 million. Authorities found him hiding in a closet under laundry in a home not far from Conroe. Everybody played a very, very integral part in the arrest and capture of this coward, and he has been magistrated. He now will be taken to my jail and uh, where his new residence will be. Our opposer was shooting a gun on his property. Neighbors asked him to go further from the house since a baby was trying to sleep. Soon after that, the attack occurred. Authorities have said that Oropoza is in the country illegally. He has been deported four times since 2009. The Biden administration sending 1,500 troops to the border ready to help Border Patrol with the expected surge of migrants when the Title 42 policy expires. Remember, that was the policy put in place during COVID to allow the U.S. to expel asylum seekers because of health concerns. Now that the policy is about to end, border towns are bracing because the borders expect to be flooded with more than 10,000 a day and without the help of the Border Patrol could be overwhelmed. I don't have enough agents, I don't have enough infrastructure, I don't have enough technology. I have other areas where I think our agents have really locked down the border security situation. Now the troops will not be there to, to they will be there for a support role only to free up the Border Patrol from all that administrative work. The Biden administration says they will only be there for 90 days. Another big city mayor complaining to Texas Governor Greg Abbott about busing immigrants to New York City. Now the mayor of New York is throwing out accusations claiming that Abbott is sending these asylum seekers to only cities with black mayors like New York, Washington, D.C., L.A., Denver. Adam says Abbott is just using them as political pawns and his city services have been stretched thin. He also claimed the asylum seekers went against their will. However, a spokesperson for Abbott pointed out that they signed consent forms. The spokesperson also said that Adam needs to quit spreading lies and complaining to Abbott. Instead, he needs to call President Biden to get him to take action. Remember a few days ago, the former mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, sent Abbott a letter complaining about the same thing. She said they have received 8,000 people since the buses started running north last year. And finally, dash cam video, Virginia. Cop got this car pulled over. Now watch your screen right over here coming around the corner. See that BMW? Look out. Bam! Whoa! Are you kidding me? The cop... Knocked down, able to get up and get over that guardrail. Appears like he's going to be okay. Another look at it in slow motion. This is a teenager driving that car, loses control through the median, and then slams. Look, the, you can see the police officer already saw it coming before he got across the median, and he's running for his life and barely escapes. Very, very close. Now, that was a 17 year old driving that car. He had two passengers in that car with him. It was traveling well over 120 miles per hour when it lost control. The vehicle lost control because cars can't go that fast on the, on the highway. The officer suffered minor injuries. The driver and two passengers also suffered minor injuries. The teen also facing charges for reckless driving. And they're lucky it wasn't worse than just minor injuries. Mm. Scary situation. Very, so very scary stuff. There's your lesson if you're teaching your teenager how to drive. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, slow. Is yes. the way to go. Thank you, David. Uh -huh. Well, PETA is offering a $5,000 reward for information that helps police arrest the person accused of shooting cattle in Bear County. Several incidents have been reported in recent days, including two in St. Hedwig. As Patty Santos explains, this is a growing concern among neighbors. Shots heard on a security camera. Sharon Viatrick says one of them likely killed her cow. I don't know why they would want to shoot it, you know, innocent animal. Um, it's just beyond me. It happened a week ago just feet from her home. They would have hit, could have hit the house and I was in the living room so it could have been 
you know, could have been fatal. So I'm afraid that if they're doing this for kicks, someone's going to get hurt or killed. St. Hedwig Marshal Mark Soto says that same day, another farmer reported a second cow shooting. We found quite a few shell cases. Soto is trying to figure out if the incidents are related to similar cases in Bear County. The sheriff's office is investigating the shooting of four cows. St. Hedwig is primarily a ranching community. So you start damaging people's property or, or, or killing their livestock, they're going to be extremely concerned and they're not going to take that lightly. He says ranchers in the community are on edge. What is it that y'all are looking for to do? I mean, there's plenty of shooting ranges around for you to go target practice. You don't need to be shooting our, our animals. That was Patty Santos reporting. Now, the cattle owner talk, Patty talked to says her animals are specially bred and have thousands of dollars invested in each one of them. Law enforcement says the shooters could face charges of animal cruelty or deadly conduct. 908, 71 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. Technology is a big part of our lives, but a new investigation shows how some devices and algorithms can contain hidden biases that result in unfair practices towards people of color. Later in the show, we're going to speak with a consumer reports expert about that investigation and what they found when it comes to health care mortgage lending and facial recognition technology. But before that, a lot of people have noticed an increase in trash along the San Antonio River after the rainfall we got last week. What the San Antonio River Authority is doing to keep the water clean. And a quick look at the roads with Transguide, looking out at I-35 at Topper Wine, where vehicles are now back on the roadway there. But we're going to get an update with Stephen Cavazos later on. After the recent heavy rainfall, viewers sent us pictures of trash problems along the San Antonio River at Espada Park. RJ Marcus stopped by the park to check it out and spoke to San Antonio River Authority about what they're doing to keep the water clean. These are photos from KSAP viewer Kaylin Gonzalez showing plastic bottles and piles of trash at Espada Park over the weekend. Unfortunately, after these rain events, we're still in a high urban area is where we're going to really see a lot of this. Tommy Mitchell with the San Antonio River Authority says this is an ongoing problem for the park after severe weather. A lot of this trash is really just sitting in, sitting in these storm drains and then once we receive that rain it just flushes it out. Mitchell says that this low water crossing can rise anywhere from 8 to 10 feet, meaning anything from old mattresses to blankets and rugs will get stuck along the tree line. We have a lot of folks that utilize this area, do a lot of recreating here, fishing, hiking, things like that, and uh, we get a lot of response from a lot of those folks going, I, I, I had no idea. And as you can see from this tree right next to me, the amount of trash that has already built up and how high above it goes water level. Now, Tommy Mitchell told us earlier that styrofoam cups and plastic bags are the things that they see the most out here after heavy rain. And with more rainy days ahead, the River Authority is asking people to be mindful of littering and not taking trash out earlier than their pickup date because chances are, once it blows away or gets onto the streets, it will end up here. Last year we had about 100,000 pounds of loose litter that was removed from this area. The River Authority is highly concerned and visibly and aware of the water quality here. We want to protect its ecosystem. RJ Marcus, KSAT 12 News. Really pretty down there almost any given day. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Out there with live cam, 71 degrees warming up just a little bit after this morning. Yeah, warming up quite a bit. Uh, now that we have the sun out, uh, things are going to warm up really quickly this afternoon. As I mentioned earlier, we got to start talking about the heat index. Right. The dreaded heat index. The reality. <laughs> yeah. It just is what it is. It is May. Uh, let's first start with the setup. I want to show you what we have across the country. Big area of low pressure out on the west coast and it's kind of sitting there. It's not really wanting to move much yet. So as long as it's there, it kind of provides us with uh, the setup that we get these uh, disturbances coming out of Mexico. And I know we've talked about this last couple of days, but you can start to see some of these uh, little disturbances that will be working up through Texas. And that gives us the opportunity almost each and every day for some isolated showers and storms. Right now we've got a few showers uh, down along I-35 between Catula and Laredo. And these are all really pretty light and falling apart. And honestly, today, I don't think we're going to see a lot. It's tomorrow when things begin to ramp up some. And as we go outside for you right now, 71 already, mostly cloudy with a dew point of 65. Easterly winds at about five miles per hour. And this is a look at the dew points. When you start getting close to 70, that's when you know the air is thick. It's the air you can wear with dew points uh, near 70 at Randolph, 66 in Bolverde, 66 Bernie Stage. 
And here's a look at the forecast high temperature today. I think once we get into the afternoon with more sun than yesterday, we're probably in the mid 80s in many spots, if not close to 90. And when you pair that with the humidity, uh, yes, it does feel warmer uh, than the actual air temperature. And as we look at the heat index forecast here going forward, today's not so bad. Uh, but tomorrow we start to see uh, an increase of about four degrees from the actual air temperature to the what it feels like number. And Saturday, the heat index could be as high as 96. That's pretty summer-like. Uh, dew points stay relatively high Sunday and Monday, too, so we still get some heat indices to talk about. So that's what we have to look forward to temperature-wise. Could we cool down thanks to some rain? Well, uh, here's the latest thinking, and this is tomorrow, not today. Uh, but I want to fast forward to tomorrow afternoon. We get some storms developing uh, out west near Del Rio and Eagle Pass. And then by 8, 9 o'clock, we get a cluster of storms that work their way towards San Antonio. So tomorrow, we have about a 40% chance of rain. And I think it's going to be mainly in the evening hours. And then that will quickly push east by 10 o'clock and uh, sort of fall apart. That's one model. They're not all completely in agreement, but they're getting there. And I think that's kind of the general idea. Tomorrow, storms out west. They form into a cluster and they work their way towards San Antonio by the evening hours. Now, we are going to have to watch for some strong to severe storms, initially especially, and then also the threat for some pockets of heavy rain too, which isn't a bad thing as long as we don't have flooding. Uh, and as we look uh, at the, the Storm Prediction Center, what they're thinking for tomorrow as far as severe weather is concerned, uh, the possibilities there from Oklahoma City all the way down to Del Rio and San Antonio, and it's a scattered risk. And it's when those storms initially get going that the threat for hail and strong gusty winds will be there. And that's something we'll be watching very closely for you tomorrow afternoon. Uh, here's how it looks in the seven-day forecast. So we've got the decent chance tomorrow going into Thursday night. But from there forward, we're talking 30% chance of rain Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, maybe a little lesser chance on Tuesday. The takeaway here is we'll have some afternoon isolated pop-up storms. The question will be when and where, and that's kind of hard to determine right now. But what I can tell you is that there is a risk for severe weather each and every day. So if storms do pop up, hail, gusty winds are things we'll be watching for. All right, if they pop up. If they pop up, exactly. Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. Stock prices slid yesterday in trading ahead of today's decision on interest rates. The Federal Reserve is wrapping up its latest two-day meeting today. It is widely expected to push interest rates up yet again. The Dow and NASDAQ both closed down 1.1%, while the S&P dropped 1.2%. Also lower were the number of jobs available across the country. Openings in March fell to 9.6 million, the lowest in nearly two years. The same Labor Department report also showed layoffs rising to 1.8 million, the highest since late 2020. 918, 71 degrees. The Fiesta Flambeau Parade was a huge success, and there were a lot of great groups to see out there. In the next half hour, we're going to announce some of the local winners of specific categories named by the Fiesta Flambeau Association. A downtown bar now taking legal action over the latest offer for its property. The owner of Moses Rose's hideout has received and rejected several offers for his business near, near the Alamo. The city and its partners have threatened to initiate eminent domain proceedings if a deal isn't made by Monday. Vince Cantu says the final offer for his bar is about $4 million too low. The latest offer of $5.626 million includes $4 million for this building plus projected lost revenue for selling the business, and that was determined by a third-party appraiser. Now, Cantu and his attorney are accusing the city, the Texas General Land Office, and the Alamo Trust of forcing the appraiser to use a discounted portion of the bar's projected lost revenue. They argue without that change, the valuation would have come out to $9.02 million. Cantu's attorney says the claim is based on a tip from an anonymous source. How confident are you that this source is accurate in what they're telling you? 100%. They are very close to this matter. Uh, this should be just a fair business deal, but evidently they don't want to honor their own agreement. Contu and his attorney say they filed the lawsuit in hopes of having the third-party appraiser and the Alamo Trust go under oath. San Antonio is, without a doubt, a city with a rich, unique history with so many places to visit from the Alamo to the five Spanish colonial missions. Now, as Jonathan Goto reports, a brand new center hopes to link all five missions and serve as a starting point to a curated experience that also encompasses Europe. 
Father Carlos Velázquez, the rector of the San Fernando Cathedral, says there has been an increase in people coming to visit the missions. He says 1.3 million people toured the missions last year, but there was something missing. There wasn't a place for the pilgrims to take in a center where they could easily access the different missions and to tell the story in one place. He says that's why the Archdiocese of San Antonio created this center, El Camino de San Antonio Missions Pilgrimage Center. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sier says it was a project made possible through the capital campaign of the Archdiocese of San Antonio. We raised for hundreds of projects $60 million. Uh, and that was including the time of the pandemic. And so we are blessed by that. Whether you're a local looking to learn more about your city or a tourist visiting San Antonio for the first time, El Camino de San Antonio Missions is a one-stop shop for an educational and spiritual experience. Not only is rich cultural places and historic places, but also of, of deep faith. Garcia Sier says a pilgrimage is a journey to a sacred place. El Camino de San Antonio Missions is in partnership with Spain's El Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Pilgrims can now receive credit towards both routes on their pilgrim passport, obtaining stamps from each mission church and the cathedral. Same thing for the people in Spain that are going through that walk. They can get it stamped and then they can go ahead and finish the walk here. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. 925, more ahead on GMSA at 9. Including how to think of your money differently to be better off in the long run. And coming up, a live Q&A with an expert from Consumer Reports about a new investigation they did that looks into some hidden biases in technology. And as we head to break, a quick check of the roads with TransGuide. Things are moving there at I-35 at Loop 410. We're going to get the latest from Stephen after the break. Time of the clock, we're approaching 9.30, and we have a great update here at 35 at Topper Wine. That crash that had been lingering around for several hours has officially cleared out, and the highway has reopened. Now, this was a pretty serious crash, folks, because we know that it shut down the highway for a period of time. We had Live Oak Police Department out there on the scene, along with the Live Oak Fire Department, but again, things are moving along just fine. I'm still waiting for some information to determine exactly what caused this crash, how many vehicles were involved, and if there were any injuries. But let's get a look there at the map. What we are seeing right now is just a little bit of progress there. Uh, although the highway has reopened, we still have some slowdowns. Traffic is a little bit in the orange there with moving at just 25 miles per hour. So that could just be folks that were dealing with the backup for a little while. So I expect that to get uh, improve as the minutes do go by. But a uh, wide look at the map at this hour does show uh, just that really seems to be the only thing that we see out there. The big slowdown there at 35. But things are moving a lot better here at, behind me on TransGuide. So uh, we'll work to get some information. And, and as soon as we know what caused that crash, we'll be sure to let you know on air and online. Mark Stuff. Thank you, sir. Technology is meant to improve our lives, but there is new evidence that doesn't always happen. A new consumer report investigation reveals some of the things that power our lives each day can contain hidden biases that result in unfair practices towards communities of color. So joining us live this morning is Consumer Reports expert Brian Vines, live from Brooklyn, New York. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, how might the algorithms that we come into contact with every day contain biases that result in unfair practices towards communities of color? You know, we come into contact with so many algorithms from helping you decide what to watch on Netflix to even what music you get on Spotify. But where these things really impact us is three areas that we delved into at Consumer Reports, and that's medical technology, home mortgage lending, and as well as facial recognition. So these were areas of impact that go beyond sort of convenience into real issues that uh, folks have to deal with every day. Brian, let's talk a little bit about that medical technology. During the pandemic, pulse oximeters, that little mm -hmm. device that nurses clip on the end of your finger to measure, measure rather oxygen levels of your blood, that helps save lives. But how were outcomes perhaps different for patients of color? Pulse oximeters are considered the gold standard in the hospital. They go in, they clamp that thing on your finger, and many of us went out in droves to buy them from 
drug stores when uh, COVID was really, really impacting communities to get a baseline and figure out what your blood oxygen levels are. But at the University of Michigan, researchers were discovering there was a discrepancy between uh, the readings that they were getting from those pulse oximeters versus arterial blood when people were showing up for COVID. And those discrepancies were really putting people with darker skin at risk because the readings just weren't as accurate as for folks with lighter skin. And they really discovered that people of color, particularly black people, the darker your skin, the more those readings were off. And it had dire consequences, especially at a time when the world was not breathing easy to get inaccurate levels of your oxygen in your blood. And what have studies found about the connection between race and home ownership? Well, one of the things that uh, we really looked at was home mortgage lending. And in the bad old days, when someone decided that race can equate to risk in terms of paying back mortgage, there was a practice called redlining that essentially drew red lines on maps in areas that had heavy concentrations of people of color. And those folks were denied loans and other business or financial opportunities. And the algorithms that we have in place today that are taking the neutral route have actually been largely programmed with the same bad information from the days when redlining was sort of the rule of the land. So while technology can be neutral, when it's fed bad information like those old discriminatory practices, the outputs are still giving us the same results. So they're equating risk with risk, and it's programming computers with bad inputs that are giving us bad results that continue to show up today. Let's talk facial recognition. That can be found everywhere these days, Brian, Absolutely. on your phone, self-checkout at the store, standing in line at pretty much any event, and security, of course, is scanning. What should people be aware of about facial recognition technology? Facial recognition, as you pointed out, is so ubiquitous right now. From all of those examples that you cited, something as easy as looking at your phone and letting it open up and letting you in, but it also can be insidious, especially when it comes to people being mis, uh, misidentified using facial recognition, as well as facial recognition continues to lag the technology with identifying particularly women of color. Black women are most often misidentified or not recognized by current facial recognition technology. So one of our experts in the films, we did three short films, one of them on facial recognition said, it's bad to be not recognized but it can be worse to be misrecognized, especially if it gets you involved in the criminal justice system, which has happened. Yeah, that's very scary. And you know, speaking of that, where can people watch this series, Bad Input, that dives deeper into these topics we just talked about? Each of the three films can be screened at badinput.com. I'm sorry, badinput.org, it matters. So at badinput.org, you can find each of the three films along with lots of information to help lead discussions with groups or really questions that you could be asking of yourselves as well as ways to take action. So badinput.org has all of the films and information and links to work that we're actually doing at Consumer Reports that really delve into each of these issues. All right, informing all of us, Brian Vines live from Brooklyn for Consumer Reports. Thank you for your time, Brian. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Thank you, and looking out there with live cam, warming up now that the sun is out to 72 degrees, expecting a warm day, but then who knows the next couple of days as far as uh, possible storms. Yeah, it's, th there's still some question marks. We do think tomorrow, though, is our best chance for rain. We're expecting some thunderstorms that are coming from the, will be coming in from the west and could bring some heavy rain to spots, which would be fine. We just don't want the severe weather, right? Uh, let me show you the big picture across the country. We've still got a big area of low pressure, and it's chilly up there across the Northeast, New York, Washington, uh, places like Buffalo dealing with rain and just cool temperatures underneath that low. That's the same case out West, but in the middle part of the country, we've got some warmth here in Texas and temperatures have made their way into the seventies this morning. You see the numbers 44 Cleveland 51 right now, New York city, 52 San Francisco, 52 in Los Angeles. You got to go to Texas and Florida to find the warm stuff. And 
It's going to be warm next couple days. Temperatures make their way into the 80s. It'll feel warmer than that thanks to the humidity. Pollen count came in. It was all good news. Mold is low. Grass is low. I will tell you there's some smoke in the atmosphere due to burning in Mexico, but it's not in great concentrations. Uh, and that'll be with us next couple days. Noontime, 79. We're up around 83 by 3 p.m. 84 is our high today, partly cloudy. No rain chances today. That changes tomorrow and really throughout the entire seven day forecast. We'll show it to you coming up in just a couple minutes. The big story today, the arrest of the man accused of killing five people in Cleveland, Texas after a days long manhunt. Authorities have now made other arrests in the case as well. ABC's Matt Rivers has the latest. Overnight, the arrest an entire community was waiting for. Accused killer Francisco Oropesa slumped, shirtless, cuffed, and now facing five counts of murder. He now will be taken to my jail and uh, where his new residence will be. Authorities in Cleveland, Texas, laying out the details. Oropesa's time on the run ending with an anonymous call at 5.15 p.m. local time Tuesday. The tip for the suspect's location came in through the FBI's tip line. About an hour after that call came in, officers descending on this home, just 11 miles or so from the original crime scene. A source close to the investigation telling ABC station KTRK the home belonging to an Oropesa family member. Border Patrol, Texas State Troopers and U.S. Marshals went inside. He was caught hiding in a closet underneath some laundry. It marked the end of an urgent manhunt that began late Friday when the sheriff says Oropesa argued with his neighbors. He was outside his house shooting his AR-15 for fun and they asked him to stop. Shortly after, that's when police say he entered their home and gunned down five people inside. He then disappeared, whereabouts unknown for days, an entire area on edge. Authorities now hoping his arrest brings relief. What's your message to the family members? They can rest easy now because he is behind bars. That was Matt Rivers reporting. Well, on a lighter note across the pond, some dedicated royal fans have already been camping out near Buckingham Palace making sure they have a great spot to witness King Charles's coronation happening Saturday. Temperatures dropped to around four degrees overnight, but despite the chilly weather, the mood was joyful among the waiting for the royal supporters. Such a momentous occasion. And like I said, I'm, I'm 61, so I don't expect to <laughs> see another coronation. I hope not, but um, at the end of the day, it's just, this is what we do, we're British, and so I'm here. <laughs> Electric, festive, because we've never seen this before. For 70 years, we haven't had such a show of Britishness. That's why all over the world right now, the only news is the coronation of the successor to Queen Elizabeth II. Now, even though it's supposed to be a happy occasion, security's on high alert for the historic event. Yesterday, police arrested a man outside Buckingham Palace for throwing what they believed were shotgun shells. And Britain's security minister said they have spent several months preparing for any number of different threats because this is a very complex event. 940, 72 degrees back here in good old Texas. You're watching GMSA at 9. The Fiesta Flambeau Parade Association has announced its winners for participants in this year's parade. When we come back, which local schools made the biggest impressions in their specific category? Hey, we want to mention some of the Fiesta Flambeau Parade participant winners. The association named the top entries by category, and here are some of them. Congratulations to the Sam Houston, East Central, and McCollum High School bands. They were named the top local bands. Mm -hmm. And congrats to Medina Valley and Pleasanton High School bands for winning in the out-of-town category. All right, congratulations to the St. Mary's University Band for winning the university category at Flambeau. And as far as dance groups, congratulations to Jefferson High School, St. Anthony's, East Central, Somerset, and Pleasanton High Schools. There were several other winners announced. To see the full list, you can head over to our website at kset.com. You can also re-watch the parade or certain performances on our website as well. We were all winners as far as the forecast went overall for Fiesta 2023. It worked out. It turned out well. We got some rain out of it, but the timing was good. Uh, and it seems like we had, some, you know, we had some fronts, which made the temperatures nice, and now the fronts have just gone away. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we're just left with heat and humidity. Uh, and the hope for some showers and storms 
First, let's start with what we've got uh, cloud-wise out there. And the clouds have cleared here in San Antonio. So the sun is out, and that means we're going to see some warm temperatures. You see the thicker clouds down to the south. So if you're watching us from Pleasanton or Gonzales, a little cloudier there. And this does have an effect on temperatures, but it's just hard to know where these morning low clouds are going to set up. They did not set up over San Antonio, so the sun is out and we're already up into the low 70s. 71 right now. 68 Kennedy and cloudy there. 71 in Catula. Bit of cloud cover. Even had a few showers earlier. 72 Uvalde and partly cloudy and mostly cloudy in Del Rio. 74. 73 Curly and Holotus and dew points are through the roof. You got dew points in the mid 60s. It is very, very sticky. And these dew points uh, show no signs of coming back down. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue to see uh, elevated humidity all the way into next week. Uh, here's a look at the numbers around the area. 72 Kelly, 70 at Randolph. Easterly winds right now and everyone is reporting uh, mostly sunny or partly cloudy skies. 76 at 11 o'clock, 79 noon time. We'll make our way up to 84 today and partly cloudy. Southeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour and then going into tonight, upper 70s. No rain chances today. I think there could be a few storms out west along the Rio Grande, but nothing here locally uh, in San Antonio. So our rain chance is close to zero, but tomorrow they jump up. 30% chance, and I would say Thursday night into Friday morning will up that to a 40% chance, but pretty consistent chances here Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and there could be some severe storms possible. There is still some timing to work out, and with the kind of flow that we're in, it's hard to know exactly when and where these storms will pop up, but we do feel uh, that there is a decent chance for some isolated storms each and every day. Let's talk about tomorrow, though. Uh, tomorrow's probably our best shot. And as we look at the uh, time frame here, 4 o'clock tomorrow, 20% chance of rain. And we're going to start to see those storms developing out near Del Rio. This is a time frame where we could see severe weather, hail and gusty winds, main threat. By dinner time, we're starting to see the storms expand a little bit. Could even see a few isolated storms around San Antonio. And we're watching what's happening out west. If these storms can form into a cluster, which the models are indicating they might, then that would work towards San Antonio by the evening in overnight hours. This is 9 o'clock cluster of storms. What do we have to worry about here? They're probably going to be weakening some, so the hail and wind threat starts to come down some, but then we have to worry about the rainfall threat. There's enough moisture in the atmosphere tomorrow where we could get some heavy rain out of this, which is not a bad thing. We just don't want any flooding or anything like that. Uh, by 10 o'clock, this is moving east and then falling apart, and by midnight, we're bringing rain chances back down, and then we'll do it again Friday afternoon. Now, I don't think our rain chances will be as good. Uh, but we'll have an opportunity to get some isolated storms Friday afternoon with the threat of severe weather once again. So the risk for severe weather tomorrow stretches from Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls, all the way down to Del Rio, just west of San Antonio, is where the highest risk will be. Again, it's when those storms initially develop out west that they'll probably be at their strongest. And we'll be looking for hail being the main threat, but wind gusts also possible. And as I mentioned, for the first time in a long time, we do have to mention the threat for some locally heavy rain, uh, depending on how this complex sets up. So 83 tomorrow, 88 Friday, 90 Saturday, 89 Sunday, 90 on Monday. Warm temperatures, warm and humid, afternoon storms with the threat of a few strong storms mixed in there. And then by Tuesday of next week, I think rain chances do start to come down as things dry out a little bit, guys. Thank you, Justin. Many of us spend a lot of time thinking about our money, but our minds often treat our monies different ways depending on how we got it. So this can have an impact on our financial well-being. And Sarah Costa explains the idea of mental accounting and what you can do about it. So let's say it's payday at your job and you get your paycheck for the work you did during the past week. Let's also say it's your birthday and someone gives you money as a present. How you think about those two amounts of money you've just received is called mental accounting. There's evidence that people spend money that they earn themselves much more deliberately than money, for example, that they're given uh, as a gift. Your brain may think about your money as discretionary money, money you can use for something fun like new clothes or vacation. And you might think of your paycheck as essential money, money used for things like food and rent. But in your family budget, all money is the same. Thinking about discretionary money and essential money differently can cause problems. So what people might do is they might spend all their money in their discretionary accounts and then be short in their central ones when they should really cut the budget in the discretionary one and move it more toward the essential. Another example of mental accounting is when you keep your money in a low interest savings account. 
while also keeping an outstanding balance on a credit card with a high interest rate. So what can you do to keep mental accounting from becoming a problem? Experts say to take those mental accounts and make them physical. Start making lists of all the things you have in your head and the money you have available to spend and start tracking it on an ongoing basis, especially when it comes to the dynamic of those optional things versus those more essential things. Valuing all the money you receive the same way can help you think about your finances more clearly and help your bottom line. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. 10 till 10, 74 degrees. When we come back, we'll look at the third and final Guardians of the Galaxy movie coming to theaters this weekend. The final volume of Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy blasts into theaters this weekend. CNN's Rick Damagella gives us a preview of the new film. I'm going to tell you something. I'm Star-Lord. After teaming up, saving the day a couple of times, and their leader arguably causing part of the Infinity War, the Marvel Cinematic Universe's family of heroes are back in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. He left out some important information, but that is the gist of it. I'm a huge fan of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies and what James Gunn, the, the writer and director of this series, has been able to do with Marvel. He really does feel like he's crafted his own corner of the galaxy, the Marvel Universe. And he's done such a great job making these characters that, frankly, I knew nothing about. Someday, I'm going to make great machines that fly. We're digging into Rocket Raccoon's backstory and his history, and there's a lot of trauma in there. I think there's a tremendous amount of emotion tied to this movie. In addition to, you know, the cool soundtrack and, and the laughs and, and the sort of sarcastic streak. I want you all to know that I'm grateful to fight beside my friends. Marvel is just this expanding universe. They've got to try new things. That's part of the, the idea of growing all of these different characters and all these different franchises. Not all of them have resonated with everybody out there, but I think people that have been along for the ride are definitely going to feel the impact of this movie. And uh, I think it's going to be a massive hit. I really do. Are you ready for one last ride? In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. That was dramatic at the end. Yeah. Oh, uh, looks like it might be good. 84 degrees today, partly cloudy. We're going to watch for storms tomorrow evening. Uh, moving from the west into the San Antonio area by the evening hours. Some heavy rain. There could be a little bit of severe weather involved, too. So uh, that'll be a time frame to watch tomorrow. Otherwise, we have opportunities for some isolated afternoon storms each and every day through early next week. And the risk for severe weather is there each and every day. It's that time of year. Mm -hmm. But uh, keep, it, keep that KSAT weather app handy, of, well, of course, alerts you should anything pop up. The other big movie release this month. Oh, traffic real quick, and then we'll chat about that. Things are looking yeah. much better here. Yes, people are back on the roadways there at I-35 at Top Row Line. It's been a trouble spot all morning along. You're talking about the movies? Live action Little Mermaid comes out uh, May 26th, uh, Halle Bailey. Melissa McCarthy, Javier Bardem, Dobby Diggs, and Aquafina starring. That would be a good one. Pumped. I bet. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. it was this month. Yep. Very good. Thanks for joining us.